Golden Radio Hour. You are trapped in the dark cellar of your home. Beside you is the murdered body of your wife. And above at the front door are your friends looking for you, tracking you down, cutting off your escape. Escape, produced and directed by William N. Robeson, and carefully contrived to free you from the four walls of today for a half hour of high adventure. Tonight we escape to a university town in England and a household where hate holds sway as we listen to John Collier's famous story, Back for Christmas. Yes, my dear. What on earth are you doing down here in the cellar? Why, just a little digging. And why, may I ask, have you chosen this day of all days to dig up the cellar floor? Why, I thought as the weather has been so damp, this would be an excellent time to plant my devil's garden. Devil's garden? Whatever nonsense is that? Oh, uh, that's my little joke about it. You see, I've managed to secure some of the spores of several unclassified wild orchids. In their natural state, they bloom under damp masses of leaf mold. The Orocanian Indians call them devil flowers because they appear to bloom under the ground. Well, I'm sure the Orocanian Indians will be very interested if you succeed in growing these ridiculous flowers under the cellar floor. Whom else it'll interest, I can't imagine. What's that terrible smell? Why, that's the leaf mold, my dear. Chemically identical with the earth blanket they grow under in the wild state. I really should line the pit with concrete so as to prevent seepage from this foreign soil. But I don't suppose there'll be time for it now. There certainly will not be time for it. Do you realize that we're sailing for America a week from today and you've made no arrangements whatever? Unless you call digging a hole in the cellar making arrangements. I certainly don't. Devil's garden indeed. Sometimes I think you're going soft in the head, Herbert. Well, I suppose it's inconsiderate of me. But you see, I've been wanting to try this experiment for a long time. But what with my lectures and seminars at the university, there never seemed to be time. Well, there certainly isn't any time for it now. I suppose you've forgotten I made an appointment for you at the barber's this afternoon. Oh, must I shave off my beard, Hermione? Now, we've been all through that. Of course you must. They don't wear beards in America. Go and get your jacket on and do as I tell you. Yes, Hermione. And don't forget to take your umbrella. It looks like rain. Yes, Hermione. Oh, don't look so put upon, Herbert. Someone has to plan things in this house, or you'd never even get to the university in time for your lectures, much less make arrangements for a trip to America. I know, but what of my specimens? There'll be plenty of time to plant your precious devil's garden when you get home from America. We're not going to be gone forever, you know. We'll be back here for Christmas. Yes, of course. Back for Christmas. I'd forgotten. Well, try to remember it. And if you can't do that, just do as I tell you. I've been making the plans in this house for 20 years. And if there's any digging to be done, I'll manage that as well. You understand, Herbert? Yes, Hermione. Good. You have just 20 minutes to clean this mess up down here and keep your appointment at the barber's. And when you finish there, I want you to come straight home. Well, I, I wanted to stop at Miss Markham's and pick up some books I ordered. Well... All right. But don't loiter there the whole afternoon, browsing over those old books the way you usually do. Now hurry and clear up this rubbish. Get rid of that smelly stuff. And no more digging, mind you. Yes, Hermione. <laughs> yes, Hermione. How many years have I been saying that? Ten years? Fifteen? Twenty? Clear up the rubbish. Yes, Hermione. Don't forget your umbrella. Yes, Hermione. Do this, do that. Yes, Hermione. Yes, yes, yes. How much longer can I stand this? Oh, 
Good evening, sir. Good evening, Miss Markham. Why, it's Professor Carpenter, isn't it? You didn't recognize me. Oh, you look ever so much younger without the beard. Twenty years at least. Twenty years? Oh, you'll be glad to know those books you ordered have finally arrived. Hmm? Books? Phytotomy of phalloid gametophytes and coniferous shrubs of North America. Those are the ones you ordered, aren't they? Oh, yes, yes, thank you. You're very kind, Miss Markham. Why kind, Professor Carpenter? Well, not many young ladies in bookshops would go out of their way to look up rare books for an old professor of botany. Oh, why, you're not old, Professor Carpenter. Really, you look... Oh, and besides, I adore botany. It's my particular hobby. Oh, really? Well, you never told me that before, Miss Markham. Oh, I was afraid to. You were so... Oh, so imposing with a beard and all. Well, I... You might be interested in some specimens of alpine polyanthes that were sent to me by a friend in Switzerland. Switzerland? I used to go there for my holidays before the war. You like Switzerland? Oh, I love every part of it. The lakes, the mountains, the beautiful spring flowers. Oh, especially the flowers. Oh, yes. It, it seems we have quite a lot in common, Miss Markham. I'm, I'm sorry we haven't talked before. Oh, I am too. <laughs> it is all the fault of the beard, I suppose. <laughs> <laughs> Miss Markham, forgive me if this sounds foolish, but I feel that shaving off my beard is the most important thing I've done for 20 years. Oh, it is. I'm sure it is. I'm ashamed that I've been so distant with you all the time. Oh, there were times when I almost spoke up. Times when you came in here, tired after day with your students at the university. Oh, you seem so alone. The way I'm alone in the world. I'd like to have asked you to stay a while and talk with me. But some way or other, I, I wound up giving you your change and letting you go on your way. You... you say you're all alone in the world? Since my father died. Well, did you never think of marrying? My father was a very remarkable man. I never found anyone who, who seemed to measure up to what he led me to expect of men. And then the war came... Miss Markham, oh, I... It, it's been so long since anyone called me by my first name. I'd like you to, if you don't mind. It's Marion. Marion. And yours? Uh, Herbert. <laughs> How long had you been alone, Herbert? Uh, alone? Oh, I knew you were a widower, of course, the first time I saw you. A widower? Oh, I can always tell. There's a certain sadness in a man's eyes. A sweet sadness, I think, when he's been married and then... A widower? I never thought of it in quite that way. Oh, perhaps I shouldn't be talking like this. But I've often wondered what she must have been like. Your wife, I mean. Hermione? Hmm. Not an easy woman to forget. Very strong. Always managing things. The house, my wardrobe, my friends. When we dined at a restaurant, she even ordered my food. She was always managing things. You might say she managed herself to death. Oh, poor woman. She must have loved you very much. But she needn't have put herself out so. It's plain to see you don't need things managed for you. You need companionship, I think. Someone sympathetic with your work. <sighs> but the last thing on earth you need is a manager. How well you put it. The last thing on earth. <laughs> That's the first time I thought of it, of course. But suddenly a whole new world opened up before my eyes. Marion and America and no more of Hermione's planning my life for me. By the time I got home, my mind was working overtime. Well, at last, you certainly took long enough about it. What are you looking so pleased about? I don't really know. Getting rid of the beard, perhaps. I feel 20 years younger. You look even smaller. Your face looks triangular or something. I'd forgotten your chin was so weak. Oh, but never mind that. You can grow it back soon enough, after Christmas. Where are you going? Down to the cellar. 
I just bought this electric lantern and I thought I'd put it away down there. Now, whatever possessed you to buy a thing like that? I don't know. I'd rather like this lantern. Might come in handy. Who knows? Now, Herbert, don't start digging down there again. I have a hundred things to do putting the house in order before we leave. I want you to carry these boxes upstairs for me. Yes, Hermione. And if you're going down to the cellar, take this along and stuff it into the furnace. But this is my old bathrobe. I may need it. Oh, nonsense. I've bought you a new one. Get rid of it. And don't start puttering down there with that devil's garden or whatever you call it. I'm through digging, my dear. I think the pit is quite deep enough now for my devil's garden. It would all have to be carefully planned, of course. Just as carefully planned as Hermione was planning the trip to America. We both went about our respective engagements as the days passed. I spent all the time I could with Marion, and finally she consented. And then it was the last day, the big day, the day we were to sail for America. Operator! Operator, are you there? I'm still waiting on that call to Salisbury. Oh, well, put them on quickly. Hello? Is this Paul Holt and Sons? Mrs. Herbert Carpenter here. Did you receive my letter? Oh, good. Now, remember, we'll be back for Christmas, and I want the job done without fail. What's that? Oh, no, I'm sure he doesn't suspect anything. Send the bill to me in New York as I instructed you. Oh, thank you. Thank you so much. Oh, there you are, Herbert. Where have you been? Back stairs. I dismissed the servants. Dismissed the servants? But I've asked some friends in to a farewell tea. Go and tell them it's a mistake. I'm afraid it's too late now. They've packed and gone. Oh, you have messed up things properly. How many times have I told you to leave things to me? I make the plans around here. Yes, Hermione. You'll have to do better than this when I plan the trip home, or we'll never in the world be back for Christmas. Back for Christmas, back for Christmas. Must you keep saying that? Well, why not? We are coming back for Christmas, aren't we? Supposing I were offered a professorship in one of those wealthy American universities. <laughs> Nonsense. Americans care nothing for botany. Luther Burbank was an American. Well, that's different. What have you ever done except muck around in the dirt with a lot of roots and tubers? They've asked me to lecture. That means something. Of course they asked you to lecture. Americans are paid to hear any foreigner deliver a lecture once. Now, there's no use getting yourself in a state about this, Herbert. No doubt this extra money will come in very handy when we arrive back, back for, for Christmas. Christmas. Precisely. And it's no good you're making a joke of it. Heaven knows where you'd be today if I hadn't got a sense of time. Yes, my dear Hermione. And since you've been so foolish as to dismiss the servants, you may empty the ashtrays and straighten up this room while we're waiting for the guests to arrive. I'm going upstairs to change. Call me when they get here. Yes, Hermione. Yes, Hermione, yes, Hermione. For 20 years, Hermione, always so right, thought of everything. Well, not quite everything. She's dressing now. Safe to call Marion. Oh, if Marion were to change her mind now, if she had any idea I was not a widower. Hello. Hello, Marion. Herbert. No. No, my darling. Nothing's wrong. My plans are the same. Unless you've changed. Good. We'll meet in New York as we planned. Yes, yes, I do love you, my darling. Herbert! I'm sorry, I can't talk any longer. Yes, I, I'll meet you in New York a week from tomorrow without fail. It, goodbye till then. Herbert, were you talking on the phone just now? Yes, Hermione. Whoever was it? Well, uh, Freddy. Freddy Sinclair, of course. Oh, didn't I hear you say something about meeting somebody in New York? Why, yes. Old Freddy said he might possibly get out to America before we leave, and I said, of course, we'd meet him there if he decides to go. That seems very peculiar. But then all of your friends are peculiar. Yes, Hermione. And just look at your jacket. Have you been digging in that cellar again? Yes, Hermione. Well, there's no need for it. You can't possibly get that devil's garden thing finished. Go and change your clothes before the guests arrive. Yes, Hermione. Oh, never mind. I see somebody coming up the walk now. Go and let them in. Yes, Hermione. Herbert. Hmm? Yes, my dear. Look out the window. There's Professor and Mrs. Hewitt. But who's that with them? Why, I... I... Precisely. 
Freddy Sinclair. Peculiar. You should have been talking to him on the phone not three minutes ago. And now here he is. Yes. Yes, isn't it? Uh, but then, as you say, Hermione, all of my friends are peculiar. Not half so peculiar as you. Digging in the cellar an hour before we leave for America. Just look at yourself. And now that I think of it... Yes, Hermione? Oh, never mind. Go and let them in. You were going to ask me something, Hermione. But the hole I'm digging in the cellar. Oh, good heavens. Stop rolling your eyes about that way. One would think you were digging a grave down there instead of a storage bin. Yes, Hermione. What's that? I said yes, Hermione. Oh, bother. Open the door and stop saying yes, Hermione. I think, my dear, I've said it for the last time. <laughs> Back for Christmas. Hermione was so positive we would be back for Christmas. That last afternoon, pouring tea for a few friends who had come in to say last-minute farewells, she kept reiterating... Oh, I promise you, Mrs. Hewitt. Remember, we absolutely must have you with us for Christmas. Oh, we'll be back. It's not absolutely certain, of course. Oh, but what do you mean, it's not certain? Of course it's certain. <laughs> After all, Herbert, old boy, you've contracted to lecture for only three months. Quite right, but then, of course... Anything may happen. Oh, Herbert adores being unpredictable. Now, what other man would dig a great hole in the cellar on the very day he was leaving for America? A hole in the cellar? <laughs> yes. He's going to put some unclassified wild orchids down there. A devil's garden, if you please. <laughs> Sounds mysterious. That's Herbert. Though he's really quite simple once you find out what he's up to. Now, take that telephone call he put through to you a few moments before you arrived, Freddy. Uh, to, to me? Yes. Herbert wanted to surprise me about your plan to meet us in New York next month. <laughs> That's why he called, of course, to ask you not to mention it. But, my dear Hermione, Herbert couldn't possibly have telephoned me within the past hour. I've been walking in the park since three. He didn't telephone you? Well, how could he? And as for my going to America... Oh, no. Come, come, Freddy. <laughs> You may as well own up. Hermione has found me out again. But Herbert, old chap, I, I really don't there. understand. There. You see what a poor liar Herbert makes. He's red as a beetroot. <laughs> Aren't you ashamed of yourself, Professor? Stringing poor Hermione along like that. And as for you, Freddy, I'm furious you said nothing to us about going to America. But look here, old girl. I've been trying to tell everyone that I have oh, no... Oh, stuff and nonsense. The game's gone on long enough. Perhaps Herbert's merely planning a surprise for me. Yes, let's leave it at that, my dear. Well, we must start getting ready. It was marvellous of you to come in to say goodbye. And don't worry about Herbert's little jokes. <laughs> I will bring him back for Christmas. You may rely on it. They all believed her. For years, she'd been promising me for dinner parties, garden parties, committees. And the promises had always been kept. This time, they wouldn't be. I'd seen to that. The servants were gone for good, the farewells all said. I had time to the minute how long it would take to fill in the hole in the cellar, in my devil's garden. Upstairs in the bedroom, I undressed, folded my clothes over a chair and put on my old bathrobe. Then I opened the door into Hermione's room. Are you ready, Herbert? Hmm. Hermione, have you a moment to spare? Of course, my dear, I've just finished. Then do come in here for a moment. Uh, there's something rather extraordinary here. Good heavens, Herbert, what are you lounging about in that filthy old bathrobe for? I told you to put it into the furnace. I shall do it today, yes. I really will, I, I promise. Well, high time. Now, what is it you want to show me? In the bathroom here. Just look. Who in the world do you suppose dropped a gold chain down the bathtub drain? Nobody has, of course. Nobody wears such a thing in this house. Then what's it doing there? I don't see anything. Well, here. I'll hold this flashlight for you. If you lean right over, you can see it shining deep down. Oh, such a lot of nonsense. Just with a... I don't see it, Herbert. Go on looking, Hermione. In just a moment... Herbert, I absolutely refuse <gasps> to wait. Herbert, what are you doing? Take your hands off my neck. I will, Hermione, just as soon as I've finished the arrangements for my trip to America. What are you talking about? You thought you were the only one who could plan things, didn't you, Hermione? Well, I've been making some plans of my own this past week... In exactly two minutes, you'll be dead, Hermione. Oh. You see, two minutes. I've planned it very accurately. You'll never get away with it. Let me go. I thought you'd say that, but I will get away with it. You won't mind the smell of the leaf mold down in the cellar when I take you there today. Yes. That's where you're going, Hermione. Into my devil's garden. That annoyed you so much. Oh. 
The soil is full of clay. It won't settle too much. In a month or so, it won't even look as if it had been dug up. But my friends, they all expect me back for Christmas. <laughs> they don't hear from me, they'll wonder. And if I don't come back, they'll start asking questions. Oh, no, they won't. Because you'll write them letters, Hermione. On the typewriter, as you always do. They'll be signed H in that neat, cryptic way you always sign your notes to your friends. Let me up. No. Oh, it won't work, Herbert. You never were any good at planning things. Oh, but I've changed, my dear. I've learned from watching you all these years. The, the lecture people in America, they, they'll expect you to be traveling with your wife. I will be traveling with my wife. But her name will not be Hermione. Yes. Fortunately, they'd never met you. I'll write a few letters home for you. Then fewer and fewer. Write letters signed with my own name. Always expecting to get back, but never quite able to. I'll keep the house one year and then another and another. They'll get used to it. I might even come back alone in a year or two and clear it up properly. Say you died in America. <laughs> Nobody will ever suspect you're lying under the floor of the cellar in this very house. Oh, but it won't work, I tell you. That pit you dug in the cellar, I'm... I can assure you, my dear Hermione, it will serve its purpose well. <laughs> Sorry, my dear. I've got to get this done on schedule. You have just five seconds to say your prayers. Herbert, you must listen. The cellar. <laughs> Don't do it, Herbert. Herbert! <laughs> oh. <laughs> The water cut off at the main as I knew she would order it. She was so thorough, but so was I. Strangulation. Nothing to wash up. The electric current shut off exactly at one o'clock, just as she ordered it. She thought of everything. So did I. My nice new electric lantern. Plenty of light to work by in the cellar. The old bathrobe she wanted me to throw away came in handy now if there should be any chance blood stain. Then into the fire with it afterwards, the last evidence of my devil's garden was going well. Still an hour till I had to leave for the boat. The hold was almost filled. No. Oh, no, not now. Go away, please, whoever you are, go away. Did I lock the front door? If it's the Wallingfords... Oh, no, no. Go away. Go away. I say, Herbert, old thing. Uh, just keep calm, quiet. They won't look down in the cellar. Keep calm. They'll go away. Where the dickens can they be? Well, the car's there. Maybe they popped round to Liddell. Oh, we must see them. All the shops, maybe. Something at the last minute. Oh, not her family. Uh, shall I shout? Oh, don't. Might not be tested. No harm in a shout, my love. No, let's come in on our way back. Hermione said they wouldn't leave till seven. Oh, all right. Only I want a last drink with old Herbert. He'd be hurt, you know. All right, let's hurry. We can be back by half past six. Half past six. Oh, there's still time. After that, it was easy. Put the finishing touches on the devil's garden, dress fast, get out of the house before 6.30, take the boat trade to Southampton and board the ship for America. All according to plan. Hermione's plan. I say, Stuart. Uh, right, sir. Uh, my wife is indisposed. She'll be taking her meals in our stateroom. Oh, for, for, for the old voyage? Yes, for the whole voyage. Well, I trust your wife is feeling better this morning, Professor Carpenter. Uh, yes, a little. Not yet well enough to leave her cabin. Oh, I'm sorry. Oh, by the way, uh, here's a copy of the radiogram you sent for your wife last evening. Oh? Oh, thank you. I'll just check it over. Hmm. I say, look here. What is it? Did the typist make a mistake? Uh, no. No, nothing important. She can correct it later. For a moment, I had the feeling that Hermione had been leaning over my shoulder again, correcting what I'd written, as she always did. I had written a radiogram to Professor Hewitt and his wife. Haven't been out of my cabin the whole beastly trip. Herbert, well, we now doubt we will be back for Christmas. The copy read, we no doubt will be back for Christmas. Exactly what Hermione would have written. The rest of the voyage was uneventful, and Marion and I met in New York and were married just as we'd planned. Just as we'd planned.
Professor and Mrs. Carpenter, we, we have reservations, I believe. Oh, yes, we've been expecting you, sir. Boy, take Professor and Mrs. Carpenter's luggage up to their suite. You know, Mrs. Carpenter, you're quite a surprise. Your letter reserving the rooms was so uh, thorough. I was expecting an older, more forbidding sort of person, frankly, ma'am. Oh, no. As a matter of fact, we're just married. But my letter reserving the rooms... Uh, I wrote the letter, my dear, and signed it Mrs. Herbert Carpenter. Purely a joke. Oh, what a cunning old fox you are, Herbert. Now that I think of it, I am, rather. Oh, I almost forgot. Uh, there's a letter for you, Mrs. Carpenter. A letter for me? I wonder who knows. Well, we shall find out in good time. Come along, my dear. We're keeping the boy waiting. Nothing like a cold, brisk shower to put a man to rights. Herbert, this letter. Uh, oh, yes, the letter. Uh, dry my hair, will you, dear? It seems to be a bill of some sort. From a building contract in Salisbury. Mm. <laughs> oh, bother. Dry your own hair. Oh, thank you, my sweet. Uh, let's see this bill or whatever it is. It's very puzzling. Herbert. Hmm? You were a widower, weren't you? I mean, Hermione isn't still alive. I can assure you she is not. Uh, let's have that letter. Hmm. Dear madam, this is to acknowledge your order together with the key... Together with the keys to your house in Launston Place. Our men had no difficulty in finding the place where your husband had begun the excavation in the cellar, but apparently changed his mind at the last moment and filled it in again. Oh, no. What is it, Herbert? Our men will begin digging tomorrow, and you may rest assured that it will be a professional job and will be completed in... Ample time for your surprise Christmas present to your husband. We are happy to be conspirators with you in this thoughtful gesture and hope that Professor Carpenter will be pleased at the results of our work on what he so quaintly calls his devil's garden. Very truly yours, Paul Holt and Sons Contractors. What does it mean, Herbert? It means that Hermione was right. I will be back for Christmas. Escape is produced and directed by William N. Robeson and tonight brought you Back for Christmas by John Collier. Adapted for radio by Robert Tallman, with Paul Fries as Herbert, Eleanor Audley as Hermione, and Marta Mitrovich as Marion. Music is conceived and conducted by Cy Fuhrer. Next week... You are lost in a London fog, exhausted and frantic, unsure if the figures looming around you are real or creatures of your fear, and behind you, pursuing you, intent on killing you lurks a murderer from whom you must escape. Next week, we escape with Algernon Blackwood's ghostly story, Confession. Good night, then, until this same time next week, when again we offer you Escape. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. London fog, uncertain whether the figures looming around you are real or creatures of your imagination, and somewhere in the wet grayness lurks a murderer from whom you must escape. (laughs) 
Escape, produced and directed by William N. Robeson, and carefully contrived to free you from the four walls of today for a half hour of high adventure. Tonight, we escape to a fog-shrouded city and the terror of a shell-shocked mine, as Algernon Blackwood describes them in his ghostly story, Confession. There was no doubt about it. The woman was dead. Her cheek was cold to my touch. The head of the long, sharp hat pen protruded from her breast above the heart. She was dead. Murdered. And I stood there by the bed, my brain whirling crazily. I was alone in an empty house with a murdered woman. And then suddenly fear flashed across my brain and cleared it. I heard the door below open and close. Footsteps. Someone was coming across the downstairs hall, onto the stairs, coming up, up here. In a moment, I would be discovered. In a moment, someone would walk into this room and see me standing over the body. In a moment, my escape would be cut off. Quickly, I slipped across the hall and into another of the empty bedrooms. I leaned against the closed door, breathing heavily, listening to those steps come closer. Would he look into any of the other bedrooms first? Would I be discovered here? He passed my door and went into the room, straight in, closed the door behind him. Then he knew where to come. I waited a moment, waited for some sound, some gasp of discovery. There was none. Then he knew what to expect. I must escape quickly before he came out of that room. I started down the stairs, carefully, to avoid any sound. And suddenly the door of that room opened. The beam of a flashlight searched down the hall. I took the stairs three at a time, burst open the front door, and fled into the street, fled into the sanctuary of the fog. How long and how far I ran, I do not know. I... I could see nothing, feel nothing but the clammy dampness of the fog. I don't know whether he was still following me or not. I ran out of sheer terror, up one street, down another, with no idea of where I was or where I was going. Perhaps I was running in circles. Perhaps I would run right back to the house. Well, I stopped. I leaned heavily against the wall. My hands were shaking as I raised them to my perspiring face. I held them there to steady them, ran them through my wet hair, My hat. I didn't have it. I'd left my hat back there in that room, on the bed beside that dead woman. And it had my initials in it. Nearby, a street lamp formed a fuzzy ball of yellow in the enveloping murk. And now a figure loomed suddenly beneath it, just as she had materialized so short a time ago under another street light. Or was it the same one? Was it she again? Was it he, the one who was following me? Was it real at all? Perhaps it was only a creature of my madness. My dear sir, you're ill. I... Oh, here, old fellow, let me help you. Why, you're almost ready to fall. Yes, sir. Thank you. Here, just lean on my arm. Yes. You are real, aren't you? Real? I don't understand. I say, you're very near collapse, you know. And I happen to be a doctor. Luckily, too, you're just outside my very house. Come in for a moment, won't you? Why, I... You're very kind. Uh, Yes, I will, if it's not too much trouble for you. None at all, my dear chap. Please do. Within five minutes, I was seated in a comfortable chair before a toasting fire, sipping a hot cup of tea. I could feel my nerves relaxing, but the traces of my illness must have been clear on my face because my host observed... Your trouble is shell shock, isn't it? Why, yes, how did you know? I've been in the service, and I'm a doctor. Of course, I I only meant I'm supposed to be recovered, or almost, but... uh, 
I got lost in the fog, felt ill suddenly. Terrified, you know. I know. You should never have been out on a night like this. If you've got far to go, you better let me put you up. You're very kind, very kind indeed, but I, I don't want to be in any trouble. No trouble at all. I'd like to be of help. It's the least we veterans can do for each other. Oh, the blasted war. Thank goodness it's over. You're not English, are you? No, Canadian. I haven't been demobilized yet. I'm still in the army hospital at Regent's Park under the care of Dr. Henry. Ah, oh, yes, yes. Very good man. I'd say he's done well by you. Up till tonight, I mean. Yes. Of course, we had no idea there would be a fog. I, I still get in a panic when I feel all alone. Well, that's usual, but then there was something more than that tonight, wasn't there? What do you mean? Simply that you've had rather a severe shock quite recently, haven't you? How, how did you know that? My dear chap, I'm a doctor. My business to know. You were in much too agitated a state when I found you for me to suppose it could have been done simply by the fog. And uh, if I may hazard another guess, I should say it would be a relief to you and, and wise as well if you could unburden yourself to someone who would understand. Am I not right? Someone who would understand? That's just it. I doubt if there is anyone like that. It's so incredible. Oh, the more incredible, the greater your need to tell it. Repression in cases like yours can be dangerous, as, as you must know. You think you've hidden it, but it bides its time and it comes up later causing a lot of trouble. Confession, you know. Confession is good for the soul. Yes, I suppose you are right. But it is so wildly oh, unbelievable. Since we're strangers, my belief or disbelief can make no difference. And I think I can promise you in advance that I shall believe all you have to say. Well... But I've got to tell somebody about it soon anyway. I, as soon a cigarette as... uh, to help with telling? Thank you. Thank you. Well, I'd better start back at the very beginning of the adventure then. It started today at the sanitarium. I've been there for some months, and today when Dr. Henry called to check on me, I knew... Well, young going... man, you're as fit as a prize heifer and twice as frisky. The diet here must agree with you. I have no complaints, Doctor, but if I'm well again, then I'd like to get back into circulation. Will you listen to him, nurse, rushing things as usual? You'd think he didn't like us here. Oh, <laughs> the way he bothers us to let him go into town, I'm sure of it, Doctor. He's getting so healthy, he's bursting at the seams. There, you see? <laughs> How about it, Doctor. Can't I just have a day or an evening in town? What's the great attraction in that dirty place? Some girl, no doubt? Well, yes, that is in a way. I, I met her in France. She's a Red Cross girl. She's invited me to stop in for tea if I'm up in London. And, well, it's just that I'd, I'd feel human again, seeing a girl having tea, a cigarette, chatting. That's all. Young man, I not only approve of your day in town, I'm prescribing it. It'll do you good. You've got to start getting used to society again anyway. And you think I can manage it alone? Why not? You get around the neighborhood by yourself well enough, don't you? There's nothing so very different about London. Certainly nothing to be afraid of. No, of course not. Uh, call the young lady and find out the directions, where to get off the underground, what turns to take and so on. Uh, go in the daytime, return before dark. No danger of getting lost. Should be simple. Nothing to it. Do you good. Then this means I'm getting better. I'll be able to go home soon? There you go. Rushing things again. But yes, I think perhaps we're on the last leg. Oh, uh, that'll be all, nurse. Yes, Dr. Henry. Now, tell me, young man, what about your friends? No, doctor. I think they've deserted me. I don't see them anymore. No more ghosts. No more dead comrades stopping in for a chat. Good. For how long now? Oh, several weeks at least. I can hardly remember when I last saw one. Thought you saw <laughs> Yes, thought. Of course, in the dark room at night, sometimes the uh, that's shadows... That's not are... quite the same thing. Lots of well people fancy they see the shadows move at night. Especially after they've been reading some penny dreadful. <laughs> yes, I suppose so. Uh, at any rate, you can distinguish between the real people and the unreal now. And that's a big step, considering how you were a few months ago. Well, it's only when I feel completely alone, cut off, that the old panic begins a little, but not as much as before. Uh, many people don't like to feel alone and cut off, but they can fight down that panicky feeling, nip it in the bud. And so will you in time. But I must warn you, 
A severe shock could undo all our work. By all means, avoid shock. Avoid shock, he said. Very funny, isn't it? But who could have known then what would happen? How could I have suspected as I went about planning my day in town, my holiday? I called the girl, arranged our tea party. I was to be at her little house in Morley Place at four. So easy to find the first time. With your Canadian backwoods instinct, she'll probably manage it better than any Londoner. <laughs> yes, I'm sure I will. It's near South Kensington Station, then. Exactly. You change at Piccadilly Circus. Yes. Without leaving the underground station. And come to South Ken. That's three streets left from there, then two right, one more left, and right again into Morley Place. It's really not far. Oh, I'll find it all right. Now, don't go to any great bother. Oh, you just leave that to me. This is a special occasion, you know. Till four, then. Until four, yes. Thanks. And so it all started out as a cheerful adventure. And everything went well into the city. I made my change underground at Piccadilly, took the local to South Kensington Station. And there I came up at surface again. And when I walked out, I stepped into a solid, opaque blanket of white fog. I could hear the traffic, the rumble of the city around me. I could hear footsteps, an occasional muffled voice. But I could see almost nothing. This is how a blind man feels then. The only objects of relief from that dreadful enveloping gray wall were an occasional blur of yellow from a street lamp or a motor car headlight, a glimmering patch from some big lighted shop window here and there, and the figures, the figures of other people passing by, dark and floating and indistinct. Or were they people? Might they not be those phantom figures again, just like the ones that haunted me before I went into the sanitarium? Ghostly, blurred figures of dead comrades from Dunkirk and Abbeville and the mud of Belgium. Ah, here comes another one. I can hear his cane tapping. Look closely now, make sure. There. He looked real enough, didn't he? They are real, I'm positive of it, and I'm not alone. They're all around me. But even as I told myself this, the old panic was growing inside here now, old fellow, you've got to get hold of yourself. Next one comes along, speak up. Speak up to him. Ask him the way to Molly Place. Ask, can you put me on the trail to Molly Place? Just like that. You'll see. Here now, here he comes. Ask the way. Beg pardon, can you put me I on... I say, is this right to the tube station, do you know? I'm utterly lost. <laughs> I want South Kensington. Why, why, yes, I have just come from there. Straight along, I think. Oh, thanks, awfully. Oh, but I say, can you put me on the trail to Molly place? He's gone. Well, no matter, he was real enough. He spoke up like a real person, all right. Maybe the next... Oh, I say, I beg your pardon. Oh, I am frightfully sorry. I, I didn't see you and you standing still. Oh, I'm afraid I, I must be lost. Can you direct me to Morley, please? Oh, dear, I, I think you've missed your turning. You'll, you'll have to double back a street and... Maybe two, and take the first turn to the right, and go one street, and then double back two, and then left again, and you come. I say thanks. That was first right, and then... She's gone. Disappeared. Like a ghost. <laughs> The panic was rising in me. They were real people, yes, but they appeared and disappeared so disconcertingly quickly. And when I turned off down the main street, there, there were fewer of them. I turned again and again. But I couldn't remember the directions. Suddenly, I, I knew I was lost. And now I was in some little backwater where passers-by were rare, where no one came, where I was alone. Now the panic swept over me. I stumbled on a curb. My cane swept empty air. 
I fell to the icy pavement. I was shaking so that I couldn't rise to my feet. I crawled across the open space of the street on my hands and knees. Only when I crossed the curb and felt a warm wall could I stand up again. And then I stood there, shaken and frantic. Molly Place must be very close, the little Red Cross girl waiting with her warm fire and hot tea. But where? Where? Suddenly, in the yellow blur of the nearest street lamp, a faint darkening of the fog caught my eye. It was not a figure this time. Only the shadow of the pole, grotesquely magnified. No. No, it moved. It came toward me. It was a figure. A woman. It came right up to me. Fear gripped me, and then I remembered the doctor's advice. Don't ignore them. Treat them as real. Speak to them and go with them. You will soon prove their unreality then, and they will leave you. And so I gripped the wall behind me and spoke to her. Lost your way like myself, haven't you, ma'am? Do you know where we are at all? Uh, Morley Place I'm looking for. Where am I? Well, I say you're more frightened than I am. Uh, may I help you? I'm lost. I've lost myself. I can't find my way back. Same here. I'm terrified of being alone, too. I've had shell shock, you know. Uh, let's go together. We'll find our way together, eh? Who are you? Name's O'Reilly, Canadian. I'm going to have tea with a friend in Morley Place. Uh, what's your address? Do you know the name of the street here? I came out suddenly, unexpectedly. I can't find my way home again. Just when I was expecting him oh, to... I say steady, ma'am. He may be there now, waiting for me at this very moment. And I can't get back. Have you any idea of the direction, ma'am? Any at all? We'll go together. Listen. And... I hear him calling. I remember. Wait, ma'am. Wait. Don't leave me here alone. I'm going with you. Wait. She was running fast through the fog. It was all I could do to keep up with her. But I felt I must not lose her or my own nerves would go to pieces. How she found her way in the fog, running so quickly, I didn't know, but I kept close on my heels, running hard. I could smell a faint perfume in the air trailing behind her. A faintly familiar odor, but not pleasant. And then suddenly she stopped and turned into the gate, so suddenly that I almost bumped into her. Oh, <laughs> is this in? You found it then. Uh, may I come in with you for a moment? Perhaps you'll let me telephone my doctor. Doctor? Yes, Dr. Henry at the Army Hospital. I'm in his care, you know. My home is somewhere here. I'm near it. I must get back in time for him. I must. He's coming to me. I, I say, ma'am. But she turned and walked toward the house. For a moment I hesitated. This woman was acting very strangely. But no matter, it, she was at least real and I needed help. Quickly, I followed her up the steps across the porch. The door was ajar. She slipped through, and I followed into the dark house. It was so dark inside, I couldn't see anything at first. I, I stopped, groping. But she went on quickly, easily, as if she knew the way. She was ignoring me completely. I heard her steps cross the hall, go up the stairs quickly. I waited and listened. She walked along the hall upstairs. And now the hair on my neck felt as if it were rising. Was she, after all, another of my figures? Was she unreal, too? Oh, at last, I found it. I'm home again. I heard her open a door upstairs, go in and close it after her. Then there was silence, profound silence. And I was alone in a dark, unoccupied house. The white-covered furniture in the hallway loomed like ghosts. And there was no sound. I felt my panic coming back. But she was upstairs. And at least she was companionship. I groped my way up the stairs. Along the upstairs hall. There was no sign of life. Where are you? I want to help you. Which room are you in? There was no answer. But as I put my hand on a table to steady myself, I, I felt something. It was a candle stump. With a gasp of relief, I took it up and lighted it. Huh. Now I could see a little. One by one, I tried the bedrooms. They were dusty and unused. The furniture covered, the mattresses rolled up on the beds. They were all alike. 
until I opened the last door. Instantly, I knew this was it. I smelled the perfume. Only now I recognized it, understood why it was unpleasant to me. It was the smell of a hospital, of chloroform. And there was the woman, her dark fur coat wrapped around her, her jewels just showing at the neck. And she was stretched out on the bed, motionless. Instantly, I... I knew she was dead. In the next instant, I thought I would go mad. The blood on her face was congealing. Her skin was cold. I knew then that she'd been dead for an hour at least. And that what I saw in the street was not real. This was the shock that Dr. Henry had warned me to avoid. And what happened then? Well, I... I heard the door open up downstairs. Someone came in. The one she'd been expecting, no doubt. And suddenly I, I realized the... The danger of my being found there beside a woman who had obviously been murdered. Well, I slipped into another bedroom, and when he went into that room with her, I slipped out and crept downstairs. I stumbled, and he heard me, and I came out. I ran down and out into the fog, into the street, and away. How long I ran or where, I don't know. When I was exhausted, I stopped. And then you came and found me. Well, what do you think? <laughs> Tall tale, isn't it? Yes. Strange, but not incredible. I see no reason to disbelieve anything you've told me. Things equally remarkable, equally incredible, happen every day in a big city. I know from personal experience. Oh, I could give you many instances. But the woman, I saw her, and yet she was already dead. Such things are hard to explain. Perhaps cannot be explained, except, of course, your mind in its present state may still play tricks on you. Perhaps you saw a woman in the fog and followed her. You may have missed her and only thought you saw her go into that house. But what about the dead woman? She was real enough. Perhaps, perhaps not. She, too, may have been just fantasy. You may never have left the street. No. No, I'm sure of that, at least. I must believe it. She was real and the man who came up the stairs was real. If I didn't believe that, I think I should go mad. Yes, perhaps that is important. Then... Let me see. Have you any proof of what you saw? Something, perhaps, that you carried away with you? None. But... But wait. I left something there. My hat. I left it on the bed beside her body. My initials were in it. Ah. Huh? And so, if it was all real, I shall be getting a visit from the police one day soon. Perhaps. And then I'll know... And I'll be charged with murder. I don't think so. You think the police would believe this fantastic story? As I told you, many strange things happen in a city like this. For instance, I knew of a similar case many years ago. Strangely similar case. Almost a coincidence. Would you like to hear it? I... Yes, I, I suppose so. It happened during the last war. A colleague of mine, a surgeon now dead, married a charming girl, young and beautiful. He was wealthy, and they lived comfortably for many years. They seemed happy together. Then came the war, and he went overseas. His income was stopped, of course. The big house closed. His wife found life not so pleasant as before. And somehow she blamed her new hardships on him. You see, she was devoid of imagination, without any power for sacrifice. But she was still young and beautiful. The inevitable young man came along to console her. He was rich. They planned to go off somewhere. Only by chance, the husband came back from overseas suddenly. Just in the nick of time. Well, he should have let her go. He was well rid of her, I'd say. Well rid of her, yes. Only he decided to make the riddance final. He decided to kill her and her lover. You see... He loved her. He planned the time and place carefully. They met, he knew, in the big house, now closed. He waited for them there. The plan failed, however, in one important detail. She came at the appointed time, but without her lover. She found death waiting for her. Oh, completely painless death. But the lover did not come. The door had been left open for him. The house was deserted and it was a foggy night like tonight. 
But he did not come. Instead, a stranger came. I... And where was the surgeon all this time? Waiting outside, concealed in the fog. He saw the man go in, and he followed him to kill him. But the man was a stranger. He came in by chance, like you, to shelter from the fog. I think that I should... Why, uh, what is the matter, sir? Well, I, I really must be going. Oh, of course, if you wish. Thank you for your kindness and hospitality. Oh, it's been a pleasure, young man. I enjoyed your story, although I confess I expected one a little different. Uh, your coat. Thank you. I'll walk with you to the door and give you the directions. Ah, you're in luck. I think the fog's lifting a bit. Doctor, may I ask, your friend, the surgeon, was he ever caught? Ah, that's the part of the story I don't know. He was clever enough so that I doubt it. Unless he told somebody, made a confession. I see. And even so, unless that other person had some proof. Oh, by the way, you, you can't walk about in the fog without a hat. Here, uh, it's an extra one of mine. You needn't trouble to return it. Thank you. Thank you very much. I went out of his consulting room with a hat on my head. In ten minutes, I was at the tube station. It was only there that I permitted myself to take off the hat and look at it. It was my own. The hat I had left on the bed beside the dead woman. Escape is produced and directed by William N. Robeson. And tonight brought you Confession by Algernon Blackwood. Adapted for radio by John Dunkel. With Bill Conrad as O'Reilly, Ramsey Hill as the doctor, and Peggy Weber as the woman in the fog. Music was conceived and conducted by Cy Fuhr. Next week... You are trapped in the dark maze of the native quarter of Mozambique. A dead man at your feet, the police closing in around you. And beside you is a girl with whom you must escape. Next week, we escape with Percival Gibbon's fast-moving adventure, Second Class Passenger. Good night, then, until this same time next week, when again we offer you Escape. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. Thank you for listening. Please like and subscribe.